Hi everyone, um, very nice to welcome you all, uh, members, friends and associates of Graphic Studio Dublin. This is the third in our series of Artists Beyond the Studio, a series of talks and lectures on Zoom um, by GSD members and visiting artists during lockdown. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce my good friend and colleague, Claire Henderson. Claire studied fine art print at NCID and upon graduating in 2005, she was awarded the Graphic Studio Dublin Graduate Award um, where she has been a member ever since. Her first solo exhibition, The Space Between Us, was held at Monster Truck Gallery in 2006. She exhibits regularly at GSD and at So Fine Art Editions. In 2018, she was awarded the Behaviour and Attitudes Printmaking Award at the RHA. Claire's work has, ex has explored many techniques of printmaking, lithography, dry point, woodblock, monoprint, etching, and all this is running alongside her drawing and painting practice. She's worked on stage sets and projections for theatre, created shadow theatres, pencil drawings, watercolours and ink paintings on paper. Initially, Claire's prints were largely monochrome, dry points and lithographs in dark greys and sepia. Her solo exhibition, I Can't Go On, I'll Go On, at the Talbot Galleries in 2010, saw her introduce a series of paintings and monoprints using colour. Since then, Claire has become a master of colour etching, creating misty seascapes and landscapes that convey an otherworldliness that seems firmly rooted in the real. Claire weaves personal histories, science fiction, plays and poetry into her work, which seeks to tell us something of the soul, the challenges of being alive and the search for something intangible. I hope that Claire will tell us today some of the fascinating stories behind her work, what drawing, painting and printmaking mean to her. And maybe if we go down any technical rabbit holes, she might give us an insight into some of the processes behind her muted and mysteriously glowing etchings. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Neve. Uh, that's a great, that's a, that's a lovely introduction. Um, today, so when Neve asked me to talk to you guys, I thought a nice thing to talk about would be my inspiration and how that happened and where it came from. So that's why I've called this Stories and Mysteries, because that's something that I think about a lot in my work. So I'm kind of Neve's introduction was very close to how I'm going to talk to you guys about my work for the next few minutes. I'm kind of going to go back in time a little bit. So, oh, in 2005, I graduated from NCAD and I was awarded the Graphics Studio Graduate Award. And that meant that I had a year's membership in GSD and I got some support, technical support from Robert and um, materials. It was amazing. And it actually, it completely guided the, um, my career up until, up until now. That same year I was, well, kind of the next year, I got an exhibition in what was then Master Truck Gallery. And I was always kind of interested in gesture, the figure, how you can tell stories through a figure, how you can tell emotions through a figure. And um, because I was always really interested in theater and um, I studied English in college for a year before I went to NCAD. I really, I was always, I always really loved theater, especially Beckett and um, just ideas of movement and really sparse storytelling. Uh, so I put this in because this was in my graduate show. And I wanted to show you what I meant by gesture. This is a um, self-portrait and it was based on this book I found in the library about um, uh, the origin of post-mortem photographs. So I reposed in poses of the um, post-mortem scenes and then made portraits of them, which sound really, really creepy. Um, but I was just really interested in these poses and these photographs and these crazy photographs that people that people were taking of of really horrendous scenes. Um, so I wanted to put that in to show you my interest in drawing and gesture. And then I made this a couple of years later. Um, this is called Ibsen Was Right. And um, I discovered Ibsen in college and um, his kind of interest in existentialism and storytelling and this is um, the series I made of photographs I took of people jumping up and down on trampolines to get the look of people falling 
um, and I, I used to do that a lot, uh, take photographs of people doing certain poses so I could draw them in kind of freeze frame. And then um, I just kind of over the years built up a bank of all these different photographs of people in different gestures that I actually still use. Like I still go back and use those different gestures. Over the years, um, I started kind of painting a bit more. Um, I discovered acrylic ink painting because I wasn't very good with watercolor, which really changed things for me because it allowed me to think about printmaking in color. Because up until then, I'd only been working in black and white, not just in printmaking, but drawing as well, like a lot of pencil drawing, um, and which obviously then led to dry point. But when I started painting in acrylic inks, then I started thinking about etching in colour. Um, and at this point, myself and me were teaching etching. So it only made sense for me to make my own etchings. <laughs> um, so this is where I started getting really into stories, personal stories, as opposed to that kind of existential idea of the story of the like, story of a, of a human some kind of um, exploration of the soul. Uh, I started getting really into collecting uh, certain kinds of stories. Um, this is called Ghost Car from The Sugarloaf. It's a painting I made for an exhibition that you've mentioned in the solo exhibition I have in the Talbot Gallery. But I wrote Martin's dad underneath to remind me to tell you the story about my friend Martin's dad. So, where, so for, a friend, friend of mine was staying with us for a while. He was making a short documentary um, about his dad. He's a Swedish guy. And when he was 19 or 20, um, his mum died. And the week after his mum died, his dad disappeared. And his dad, and so he left his, his, his son and his, and his daughter, Martin's sister. Um, and the dad, the dad eventually kind of came back into the life, into their lives, but he disappeared for about four months, I think. And he went from Sweden through Europe, through the UK to Ireland, to the west of Ireland, went to one of the very westerly points of the west of Ireland, to an island called Dersey Island, which is um, off the coast of Cork and is connected to Ireland by a cable car. And he was seen around there and he never told Martin what he'd done while he disappeared. He was seen around there and he was seen around other places. And so years later, when Martin was making documentaries and kind of working through the emotions that came up from his dad disappearing, he came to stay in Ireland and then made a doc retraced his dad's steps and made a documentary about it. And that's why he was staying with us. And the story really captured me. Um, it's just, it was, it was so emotive, so sad, but so full of, full of, and you can absolutely understand why Martin's dad did that because he was grieving and um, just something really interesting about that separation, but also the connection and um, the retracing of the steps years later, I found really fascinating. Also, I had never heard of Jersey Island. Um, and so that kind of really sparked something in me about islands and about the connections between places. Um, and so years later, myself and we went to visit Jersey Island, which was uh, something that was an amazing trip and, and, and really, really, again, informed, informed my work. Um, this is a painting called Red Places, All Apologies. Um, I'm just going to zip through it really quickly. It's just it's a painting from that time and um, that informed my etchings later that you see. Um, so in 2012, James McCreary asked me to be in an exhibition with himself and John Bean. And um, he was doing work about the sea at the time. And so he asked me, because I was making work about the sea, to carry on with that. So I started making etchings about the sea based on all these stories that I that I had. Um, so this is called, actually called Waiting in a Moment. I wrote that wrong. It was a different one called Waiting in a Storm. 
um, and it was one of the first color etchings I made. Um, and it was just, it was so great to exhibit with James and John. It was so cool that James took a chance on me. Uh, and that's another one that's again um, showing you the connection between my painting and my, and my printing that I'd made that painting first and then um, made the etching a couple of years later. And now I do that basically all the time. I'd make a little painting to plan out uh, what I'm going to make an etching of. Um, so my paintings aren't really particularly very, very good or anything. It's just, they're just kind of plans really of kind of what to do next. Um, then islands and seas started kind of taking on a whole new meaning for me. Um, this is from an exhibition that myself and me and Yoko were in, in 2016, <coughs> excuse me, 2016 called Islands and Other Seas. And so it's still thinking about stories and um, connections through time. And um, I made an actually of this lighthouse because it's the uh, set from John Carpenter's film The Fog, which was made in 1982. Um, and this is Port Grey's Lighthouse, uh, which was built in 1870. Um, so I was really interested in that idea of um, something symbolizing loads and loads of different things. The lighthouse in The Fog, in John Carpenter's The Fog, is a radio station, which is also something that I adore of um, radio and uh, communication. Um, I put this in, it's from the same exhibition in 2016, it's called The Secret History, Gally Hedrick's Court, 1871, and I made this because of the story I heard when I was visiting Gally Head Lighthouse. It's now um, under the um, it's still an Irish, it's still a working lighthouse, but it's also at the Irish Landmark Trust. And so you can rent it out and stay there. I'm staying there with some of my friends and Jared, the lighthouse keeper, um, who in, invited us to stay uh, when he was showing us around, told us that we could do a tour of the lighthouse, which I jumped at the chance to do and pestered him until he actually was up there straight away. Um, <laughs> So I got to actually go inside a lighthouse and look at the lamp and he explained so many fascinating things that I probably didn't really fully understand. But lighthouses are just so fascinating and amazing, the connection from so far away and their safety involved and they're they're just they're fascinating and they're also really just a structure is quite beautiful. Um but there was one story that stuck out when he was giving us the tour and that's why I made this piece, that's why I was struck to make this piece and this, that's why there's no lighthouse in the piece. So um, the Joseph Sprott was a ship that um, ran aground in 1869 or 70. And he was telling this story on a tour similar to the one he was giving us and he said the reason the lighthouse was built because the Joseph Sprott, it was the second ship to run aground at Gallyhead that year. And the shipping companies were losing so much money from these ships running aground at certain places, but that's why they started, they, they commissioned the lighthouse to be built in certain areas. So the lighthouse, the Joseph Sprott, was the kind of um, impetus for that specific lighthouse that Gallyhead to be built. He's telling this story saying that all hands were lost on the Joseph Sprott. And everybody died, which is horrific. And then a lady in the background puts up her hand and says, That's actually not true. There was no survivor, but it wasn't listed. And it still isn't listed in the manifest. If you go on and Google just as well, it still says everybody died. This lady told Jared that there was a family who tied a two or three year old little girl to a wooden chest in the hopes that she would survive and when these people called wreckers came down to basically like um, go through the, the rubbish of the um, vessel they found a little girl floating in the water tied to a wooden chest and they took her in she looked by all accounts she said they, he said they looked she looked asian she only spoke french 
so they think she came from Polynesia. Um, nobody else, everyone else was gone. These people took her in. Because of how she looked and the fact that she didn't speak Irish or English, they couldn't keep her because it, everyone at the time, it would have been really, really dangerous for people to know it, it was illegal to um, be a record, it was illegal to take stuff from the ships. So they sent her off to a uh, family in Neve. And she grew up in Neve and had a whole life and um, emigrated to the US, married, had children. Her children had children, her children had children, and then this lady goes back to Galley Head to tell Jared this story over a hundred years later. Um, it really spoke to me, this this idea of, I mean, it's it's just like, I'd almost be crying now telling the story. It's, it's just, for me, there's something so tiny and insignificant about the poor little child and what she created with all those people after that. Um, Jared kindly got me in touch with her, her great great granddaughter, and that's why I, I know so much of the story because I got in touch with her and she told me more of the story. She sent me photographs of her uh, parents, grandparents. It's it's so beautiful the the uh, survival of that and, and what it created. And she's now writing a book about the story and everything that um, happened afterwards. And um, for me, there's something still kind of secret in that moment. Uh, we'll never know that little girl's life previous to that moment where she was found. Um, so that's why it's a secret history. Um, the next year after um, that exhibition um, that I had uh, with Neve and Yoko Islands and other seasons took place at I had an exhibition in So Fine Arts with Neve and Scott called Inside Worlds and um, I started making larger etchings for that um, still thinking about stories and I was lucky enough to I've got a friend who is a marine biologist and he circumnavigated the Antarctic in 2016 and he's a really good photographer and he uh, took loads of photographs as that as that research trip was happening and gave me all his photographs to work from. So this is a photograph that Giuseppe, Giuseppe Suarez is his name, that Giuseppe took of Bouvet Island when he was there. So it's kind of like a virtual tour for me. Like I like working from images that I've taken. And um, sometimes that isn't possible because I want to talk about something that's really, really out of my grasp. But with this kind of stuff, with like information that Giuseppe gave me, I feel there's Kind of a nicer connection because my friend but also um i kind of i know that the person that was there and so i kind of feel it's just slightly different for me than just getting a photo off google image and looking for that or looking for composites of photographs this is called the mystery of Bubet island um because giuseppe told me this story and um, Bouvet Island is one of the most remote islands in the world. It's in the it's in the Antarctic ring or just just near it, but it's it's um, very inaccessible. And um, there's nobody living on it. It's basically a massive glacier. Um, it's snowy all year round, uh, but it's really interesting for scientists because it's so remote. Um, kind of similar to like the Skelligs, this idea that there's uh, certain flora and fauna that are only there. Um, and so it's a really interesting place to study. So scientists have been, like since it was discovered, uh, discovered um, by, it was really, oh, I think it was years ago, um, scientists have been going there and using it as a kind of base of study for certain, for certain animals and also for seawater and things like that. In the 60s, a group of scientists arrived on the island and there was a boat there um, in the middle of the island, in a lagoon in the middle of the island. They couldn't find, they didn't find any people, they didn't find any bodies or anything like that, they didn't find anything in the cab, but there is no understanding of how that book got there. 
and there's different theories, but none of them really check out. The boat looks quite like the James Caird, which is a boat that, um, which is one of the boats that the Shackleton um, uh, party used as a lifeboat. So it's kind of like, you know, that kind of curve kind of shape, but much bigger uh, wooden. But there's no, re it's not the James Caird and they don't really have an understanding of how the boat got there. Um, it also, that island being so remote that there's scientists, scientists can't figure out, I'm not going to figure it out, but um, that's the mystery. It's kind of like in certain circles, kind of a bit of a famous mystery. Um, and I just love that idea that there's that somebody, that there's a mark there, that there's some kind of human mark or remnant left on the island inexplicably. Um, so I made a um, etching about that and then, sorry, no, it's half 11 now, and then I made a companion piece um, which is uh, same, same size um, plate and same kind of process, just different colours and um, telling a slightly different story, which is more um, kind of about um, uh, more mysterious things like strange, strange occurrences in, in, the, in the South Seas, like strange lights and things like that. Sailors have reported over the years. I think that's where I'll leave it. If anyone has any questions or anything like that. Well, that was lovely, Claire. Thanks a million. Yeah, I don't know if I hope I didn't write through stuff. I just, I just had a couple of stories I wanted to tell. So, no, they're they're really they're really fascinating. Um, I, I have a, I have a question for you. It's kind of it's kind of about travel and, and this year, I guess. Um, like travel is really important. Obviously, it's a part of your work. You know, you're constantly going places and. You know, it's definitely refreshing your your research and, and that kind of thing. Uh -huh. And I'm just wondering, how have you found it the last year when you can't travel? Have you got notebooks and stuff to fall back on, or is it like has it changed your your practice in any way? Good question. I, I, it didn't really it didn't really bother me that much. Like I went like I went to the west of Ireland um, a good bit, and that's like there's so much there. Like I could I could spend my whole life in the west of Ireland and still still find new interesting interesting things um the i do though it's actually it's actually a good question because it just made me think about the fact that i've been thinking more and more about gesture again so like i went um from like those people that were so big in 2005 2006 became really tiny and like those stories were being told through kind of weather events and places and I think there's like kind of an arc coming back again now that I'm much more interested in the gesture again and kind of like zooming in on those people. And maybe that's because I haven't seen that much or traveled that much that I'm kind of, there's kind of like a slight more inward inward look again that I'm thinking a lot about um, gesture as opposed to place. Mm. Yeah. So maybe it has affected me and I didn't even realize. I'm here. Just about Jersey, Jersey Island, if you yeah. some people who haven't been there, maybe you could explain about the, the cable car, the significance that of the... Oh, yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So... Um, I was um, on two years ago, a couple of years ago, I went across. So some people oh, might so, have been there. It's so beautiful. It's so it's such a fascinating place. So so the people of, of um, around Ali's... Um, and uh, like like the, on the mainland, um, used Jersey to graze um, their cattle and sheep on for hundreds of years. Um, they'd they'd go across, they'd like take their their livestock across on, on tiny little boats. And in the fifties or sixties, I'm not great on that kind of stuff. Um, I think I think it was in the fifties. Um, a cable car was commissioned to safely bring people across because Jersey is um. Like it's got quite a high landing, like it's it's quite difficult to, to 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 get onto, and it's not really very safe, even though it's a very very short distance. So, um, some genius came up with this idea of putting a cable car. And actually, back then there were more cable cars. Like there was a cable car in Bray Head. There were more of those kind of slightly more analog things, um, in in Europe. 
And so a cable car was commissioned and the cable car can take, like there's even a little notice still on it, it can take one cow or three sheep um, okay. or then like a couple of people, like it's, it's small. Then it was remade in the 80s, like the actual car itself was changed and the original car is on the mainland up um, up a little bit from, from the cable car station, which is really quite lovely to look at as well. And um, so that, that's that's the reason it was it was it was built. And then because it's such a novelty, especially now, it's such a novelty that now it's the kind kind of become a tourist attraction. But the people still use it for for moving livestock across, and they get preference. You know, so if you're in the queue, it's never happened to me. I've gone over twice, and if you're in the queue and there's like livestock in there, you get booked. But um. I, I don't, I, I don't know, it's never happened to me. You mean you didn't go over with a cow? No, did you? No, just a couple of people. Six is the max, I think, six people, if there are no cows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's amazing. That. Yeah, yeah, it is amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Claire, that was great. Um, I just noticed that like in your earlier work, there's load, a lot of white or negative space. And, and then in your later work, there's like little or no kind of empty or, or white space. Is there a reason for this move into like filling the, the image? Yeah, I don't know. I wonder, like, um, I kind of, that's the subject, right? Mm. And so I kind of see this as background. I wouldn't say it's, it's pointless. That's not what I mean, because as opposed, you know what I mean? But like, this is the subject, this is kind of, I kind of see it as the same thing for me. Well, it's kind of interesting because the subject is is almost in the ne in the negative, do you know? Yeah. The subject is in, in the positive. Yeah. This is very helpful, guys. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. I never really, you know, like there's still, yeah. Well, I guess there's still a lot of space. It's just the space is treated differently, maybe. It's just really interesting to see. I hadn't seen a lot of your earlier work. The self-portrait is, is beautiful. Well, thanks. Hi, I'm just looking at the last etching that you put up. Um, um, pinks and, yeah, that one. Um, can you maybe talk a bit about your process? Um, I'm looking at it and wondering, is it an etching? Um, how many plates are there? Yeah, I'll tell you exactly how I did it. Thanks. So there is there's, uh, two, two plates. One is an etching and one is a monoprint. So... Okay. The etching is um, the navy part and the grey part. So it's 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 inked up in two different colours, one down here and then the greys, or like you might see them as blues, like yeah. all this stuff up here. Mm. And then, um, and that's like a load of different techniques built up one at a time, um, like dry point, hard ground, um, Aquatint, Spitbite, um, actually this is um, an experiment that myself and Neven Roberts did years ago when we were, when we were printing um, Alice Mars. Do you remember that Robert? You, um, we, were, we were printing Alice Mars and we were trying to get a really rich, nice roll-up, which is quite flat which is quite mm. difficult to do if you're using uh, colors that are contrasting to the paper. So like anything of, over light cream or cream, light gray, light blue. Um, the, the, it starts kind of spotting and stuff like that and different, different things. So um, we tried a load of different experiments to try and get that flatter. And one of them was to make, uh, to do a roll up on a textured plate. And like, like basically like, an, like a flat aqua tinted uh, textured plate but um, we didn't do that and um, we messed around with this idea of grinding a plate so Robert put a, put a massive big copper plate on a lithography stone and ground it the way you grind a lithograph stone and obviously I mean we didn't know what we, were, what we were doing that's like the whole point of experiment but like what happened because copper is soft as it was ground it ground unevenly so um, it kind of had these like swathes of areas because it bent as it ground, so it didn't, um, so it would grind in one area and not other. 
um, and it was it was really really beautiful and and um, we laughed about the fact that it didn't didn't work so he cut up the plate into six uh, or nine gave me three me three and he kept three and I used those three to experiment with and make some early etchings that aren't in this but I used the same process then to make this guy so I covered up this part and ground this bit with carborundum and stone and then underneath that um, I did a blend roll which you can't really see but there's a, actually a lot of it there so the blend roll has pink then blue then pink then peach then cream then peach then pink and that's a blend roll that gets printed first mm. underneath the etched plate, which is the navy and the grey. Mm. That's great. Thank you very much. Lovely. Symbols. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> question. Hi, Niamh. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course, Kate. Um, Claire, you have an interest in theatre. And did I read that you actually worked in the theatre? And <laughs> I'd just love to know a little bit about that and how it influences your work. Um, I did, yeah, yeah. So I, when I was in UCD studying English, I basically spent the whole year in the drama society making sets and stuff like that. And uh, like I always, I just loved, like even when I was, even in school, like I just loved plays. Like I, I, I don't even, yeah. So anyway, so um, I messed around with sets so much that I realised I should just go to art college instead of finishing my English degree. So um, that's what happened there. But then... Um, I met a, a, friend, a good friend of mine, um, Louise White, she's a theatre theater maker, theatre director and writer. And when we first made friends, um, she said, she's like, we're, we're going to do something together at some point. And so as she started making more plays, then she asked me to um, collaborate with her. So we, she got a, some funding and um, came up with this beautiful idea for kind of like a like kind of an apocalyptic kind of play for kids um, that we devised where I was the visual artist and she was the writer and um, I made paintings um, in response to her ideas about um, the landscape of Ireland post recession where we had these kind of ghost buildings and stuff like that. Anyway, so again, it was about gesture. So um, I sat in on all the theatre rehearsals and did drawings and photographs of um, uh, the actors and then used those gestures to make paintings from. And then they were projected in the background of the painting. Um, and then, and then other people asked me to kind of do artwork for, for their plays. It was all fringe stuff. And like Louise is amazing. She's, if you ever see her work, like check it out. It's really, really interesting. It's beautiful stuff. Um, and we just collaborated on something there recently. Um, but uh, working in theatre is really hard. Like working as, a, as an artist is like, it's so rewarding and enjoyable, but it's, it's it's like it's hard in those other ways and working in theatre is really hard as well and so I love doing it like when people ask me to do stuff I, I do it but I wouldn't be chasing chasing it um, but uh, I absolutely absolutely lo loved being involved actors are amazing like the stories they can tell with their bodies are just so amazing mm -hmm. can I ask something just on stories too Claire um, you obviously love picking up the story and running with something and making artwork out of it. Do you find with the recent kind of um, interest in podcasts and stuff that you, you tend to link into podcasts? Do you pick up stories from that? And would that anything develop from stories that you would hear outside of directly from a person? Not yet. Um... I listen to loads of podcasts um, and I, I listen to like um, a lot of fictional podcasts and um, like radio plays like um, but uh, I actually just just got into like old timey uh, detective radio plays from the from the 30s 
Uh, <laughs> so, but like, um, no, I wonder why. There's something about um, there's something about somebody telling you a story personally, um, and also, I really love the written word. So, um, stuff like just just wor words written down, um, lines of poetry, speeches fiction novels those kind of things um maybe they just speak to me a bit more because they're written down i don't know like i, I wouldn't i just haven't yet but i listen to loads of um podcasts so maybe maybe something i bet i bet i have and i just can't think of anything right now yeah but nothing <laughs> nothing comes to mind Susan. yeah okay i just have one more question for you claire <sighs> Um, what are you what are you doing now what what are you up to now that you can't print <laughs> um, I'm painting so I'm I've I've wanted to paint for years and I'm really not very good at it I've been painting with acrylic inks because um watercolor is too hard for me I started I tried watercolor when I left college and it just turned to mud I gave it like three hours and it was just like no it's not gonna work um, so I started painting with acrylic inks so those paintings at the uh, yeah those ones and they're acrylic ink they're not they're not watercolor they're amazing because they dry on layers like I'm basically making a print using paint kind of but like they dry in layers they don't muddy each other so they're really beautiful to work with um, and last year I went on a residency in Peru just before corona happened and um, I started playing oil paint which is gorgeous so I'm learning painting at the moment so I signed up for like a little watercolor tutorial. So I'm going to do, I am doing watercolor paintings, which are these ones here. And then um, I'm going to learn oil painting. Um, and I want to get more into uh, portraiture and stuff like that. I get, get back to the gesture thing that I was talking about earlier. Um, and uh, I just got a studio, which is amazing. And um, a shop in town, we make good, commissioned me to make a series of, cards about love and um, like soulful connection and stuff like that that they wanted to produce so they just um so i just finished that that commission and um so that's why i've got yeah yeah anyway, that's what I do. you're also very interested in doing birds i'm very good at it what's your where did that interest come from oh thanks susan i just um there's something about the uh, the horizon, like like I, I love this the sea, um, but also like the things that are in the air, uh, like there's something ab ab about that that I really really love. Uh, so anything that flies, like it's not just birds, like um, hot air balloons, cable cars, uh, helicopters, like they've all over the years features. You do a good kite. Thanks, Neve. Um, yeah, kite. Forgot about kite. Um, so, like things that are up there, away, are are also are always good. But birds, just they're so beautiful. They're so nice to draw. There's there's so much there's so much in them. They're so lovely to paint. Like I really enjoy. Like if I have, like if I'm if I get a commission that it, that isn't going to fit into like my style, I just do birds because it's so. So lovely. I was working on a turn, an art, the art of turn is um, the bird that um, covers the most distance out of any bird. They fly um, basically all the way around the world um, during their migration. They're fascinating. Like um, They hardly ever sleep and when they do sleep like all birds, they have like the, you know, the bicameral mind where their, their, uh, their brains only half, like half the brain goes to sleep so they can still fly and then the other half goes to sleep. Um, so they're fascinating creatures and they're just like, they're just such gorgeous shapes to, to draw and paint. Um, 